really worried about what to preach about today, you know, because uh, I don't want to appear partial with the Super Bowl going on today. I don't want to, you know, because we have friends maybe watching the videotape from other parts of the country, like Colorado, and, uh, and they may think that the Lord is going to bless them. And then here I would come along and say, no. So, but I, I, I uh, was reading a little bit this week, and Russell Wilson, who's a, a Christian brother, says that he prays before every game, but he doesn't pray to win. He doesn't ask that God gives him a win. He said that uh, he prays that, uh, that the players from both sides will not be injured and that, uh, that he'd be able to play to his ability. And that, that's his prayer. I thought, well, that's, that's what, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to appear indifferent today, except I got a, an email from one of you. Um, we'll go nameless, Sheila. And, uh, <laughs> and she said, how can you preach about the 12 disciples and not talk about them being the original 12th man? <laughs> and, and I pondered that theologically, and, uh, and I went, could it be? And then today, I was talking with uh, Juan Espinoza, who's uh, teaching our Sunday school this morning, and he was all excited because he was going to teach a Sunday school lesson about the 12th man. And I, and I <laughs> in running out, I went, Juan, we've got the same message in the sanctuary, in the Sunday school. And he goes, are you preaching about Matthias, who took Judas's place? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. See, if you're a cricket player, the 12th man is the person on the team who takes the place of the injured one. That's actually, but we're not cricket fans, so forget it. Um, okay, so I've had all kinds of uh, uh, ponderings about this, and I, and I would like to say, first of all, that you can take this too far, okay? Not to be a, a party pooper uh, before the party, but... Um, so Monday, January 27th, a little girl was born, Cindy Lee Mann. And her parents, there's a Swedish hospital, on First Hill. Uh, they decided to give a, a new middle name, 12. <laughs> Cindy 12th Mann. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> Uh, she's joining her uh, other children, Elise, uh, 10, and, D and Dylan, 6, who are already Seattle fanatics in their own right. Um, I'm looking at this going, really? <laughs> this is under that category, really? And, uh, and people uh, call us mean, the parents say, asking, how can you do this to your kid? Some have even called it child abuse. Uh, but um, the parents say, we thought it was amazing how some people have been so negative about a middle name. It's been a roller coaster of emotion. Uh, we've taken some negative hits, just like the players today, but I think it's really helped us become more centered around who we are and really focused on what's important and not looking at the rest of the world. Now that's a testimony. This has helped them become really centered around what's most important. So I don't, I'm not recommending necessarily that you name your children 12th, but um, so that's not what I'm holding up as a, as a model for us, okay? But um, the 12 disciples, 12th man, I don't know, maybe, maybe there's a connection. So I went to uh, John, uh, um, chapter 15, not chapter 12, okay, so get over it. Um, that was a, it's a stretch anyway, okay, trying to make that work. So um, uh, beginning in verse 5. Oh, what, what, why don't we go to verse 4? Let's ramp up. John 15, verse 4. Remain in me. He's talking to the 12 disciples, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. And then he says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If a person remains in me, and I in them, they'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, 
They're like a branch that's thrown away and it withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Then he says this, As the Father has loved me, so I've loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I've obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that they lay down their life for the friends. You're my friends. If you do what I command, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know the master's business. Instead, I've called you friends for everything I've learned from the Father I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. So Lord, teach us from this your word. Teach us how we might remain in your love. Teach us how we might uh, be your disciples. Teach us how we might uh, be fruitful as you uh, live your spirit through us. And uh, guide us forward in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is a, a very, very important passage of Scripture because it, it comes at the, at the very end of Jesus' earthly ministry. He's gathered the uh, people who are closest to him and um, has told them, basically, here's the deal. This is what matters. Uh, not naming your baby 12. That, that's a little different focus. But here's what matters. And... Uh, I think that uh, we need to be reminded of what's most important and what it is that, that Jesus has in mind for us when he calls us to be his, his disciples and to follow him and then to live out the implications of that in, in our everyday lives, right? So what does that mean? Well, I, I went to some great theologians to try and learn uh, from this. And uh, so... I went to some of the um, Seahawk players and their interviews, and I did some research on them. Um, what? <laughs> I, I gotta do this, you know? So, first of all, um, there's been some bad stuff about Richard Sherman, okay? And I'm reminded of the passage here uh, in chapter 14, you know, the world hates you, or, or no, in the verse 18, if the world hates you, keep in mind the hate of me. I thought of that with Richard Sherman, right? <laughs> with, it, with his rant and all those things. So I did some uh, research because he's the one who got up uh, after the championship game and, and what did he say? I am the greatest in the world. I am the greatest in the world. He said, I'm tired of people talking bad about me. I am the greatest. And, uh, and some people took that as a negative. They took that as being bragging. I don't know where they could get you know, such a thing. So I, I went and looked up the evaluations that were done when he was going into the draft as a pro. And what the experts, the, the, the scouting professionals, had to say about him. I'm sure they recognized his talent, right? This is what they said. Sherman is a prospect with some good intangibles that will help him mold into a contributing backup. <laughs> that's the praise that's the evaluation uh, however he does not possess natural instincts <laughs> he does not possess fluidity or even bursts of speed to be considered a future starter on any team Awareness is only adequate. His average ball skills have some upside. 
I'm, think, I'm sitting here going, no wonder he was hurt and angry. No wonder he was saying they were wrong. You know, uh, the world was hating him and they didn't understand what was going on. So now I'm, I've suddenly become sympathetic to Richard Sherman and I'm, I'm hoping that he proves them wrong. Um, average skills, no vision, no ability really or instincts to play. Uh, he might aspire to be a good backup or maybe on the, he could get a place on a practice squad somewhere maybe. Um, so then I thought, well, let's look to uh, Cam Chancellor because he's really sort of a, a hard hitting brick wall of a player. And he actually gave me the insight that helps me understand what it means uh, in terms of our faith. This is going to, this actually ties in, okay? Trust me. So Cam Chancellor um, says, um, everybody says we're a really young team, but I think we're learning. Uh, we're learning things in the, from the past and we're moving forward. Nobody's perfect, everybody makes mistakes. I think if we make a mistake, we learn from it, we talk about it as a team, and we move on from it, and we leave it in the past. He said, I knew, they asked him, were you disappointed because you were taken in like the fifth round, you're like the last player ever taken right there with uh, Richard Sherman. Um, he said, I knew coming out, a lot of guys viewed me as a tweener. Uh, they weren't pretty sure that I was going to be or what I was going to do. I think I was kind of mad when they drafted me in the first round, in the fifth round. And then I looked at it and I saw it was a blessing. I think it was a blessing that I'm on this team. It was a blessing that I'm playing with the guys I'm playing with. It's a blessing that I'm with a great coach. It's a blessing that I'm with a great staff and program. I think it's a blessing. I'm here for a reason. Now, you know, I'm someone who uh, kind of, I, I go through life thinking of all the things that aren't working right and why and you know, those kind of things. And I realized I could learn from uh, him because if we see what God's doing in our life and we see a bigger picture of it, we can begin to see that actually we're blessed. We're not lucky, although sometimes we're lucky, but not often, uh, and, and we're not better than other people, but, but we are blessed to be where we are with whom we're traveling, right? Uh, that the Lord has done something far bigger than us in our lives. And I think that that's so important for us to realize God is up to something that's bigger than us. And, uh, and what does it take? Well, Jesus lays this out here. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Cut off from me, you're on your own. You, you can do nothing. But, but with me, with me, we're part of something, we're growing, we're fruitful. And he's saying, stay connected to me. Stay connected to me. Stay connected uh, as, as part of what I'm doing in this life. Uh, Jesus was getting ready to spin those disciples out on their own, right? And he's assuring them that he's gonna be with them. And then he, he, he tells them, here's the purpose. Here's why I've come. Why I'm saying these things to you. So they'll be better people? No. So they'll be uh, competent in their chosen profession? No. So they'll be smart Bible study answer question people? No. Why is he saying this to them? I'm saying this so that my joy would be in you. That's why I'm telling you this. So my joy would be in you and your joy would be complete, be full. It's all about joy. And, and somehow, and we tend to miss that, and we miss that, that uh, you know, this was a perfect part for Jesus to get hard line on them, right? Toughen up, you people. Instead, it's, no, 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 this is about joy. This is why I'm doing this. This is why I'm telling you these things. I want you to, to experience uh, life the way I experience it. And I want your joy to be full. And, and I realized, you know, for us to miss out on the joy of what Christ wants to do in us and around us and through us, if we miss that, we miss the whole deal. 
And we can be the most successful people, we can be the most looked up and sought after Christians in the world, and, but if we don't have the joy, it's for nothing. And, uh, I just, you know, I had somebody tell me once that, you know, uh, I don't like this church because there's too much laughter. <laughs> no kidding. And, uh, and, I, and I said to them, you know, I could throw a rock and hit five churches where no one will smile. You know, and that's easy. I don't even have a good arm. That, that's just the way it is. And I said, why don't you go find one of them? Um, I'm really glad that we got accused of being uh, too many smiles in here, too much laughter, too much, uh, too much joy. What an accusation. Um, but then Jesus said, I'm, I'm giving you a commandment here. I'm giving you a commandment. Okay, here it comes. My commandment is that you love one another. Just like I've loved you. You love one another. That's what, that's what I'm calling you to. Because you're not going to experience the joy apart from loving relationships. You're not going to experience the joy when you're alone, when you're pulling out of everything and isolating and uh, there's no joy in that. The joy comes in, in loving and in choosing to love just as Jesus loved us. And uh, and so I think about this. Um, is If that's our commandment, then we need to become disciplined about this. I, I've been, you know, I'm studying from the Seahawks, so I'm, let, me, let me share some more with you here. Again, Cam Chancellor, who's uh, probably a great philosophical uh, genius. He says, you know, we, we just stick to what we do best. We're very fundamentally sound. We have to teach fundamentals. That's what you're taught, fundamentals as a kid. You do your fundamentals to the best of your abilities and things start to turn out. And he goes on, it's just fundamentals. You hear that word? It's just the fundamentals. They said, well, what about one-on-one -on -one matchups? If you have a one-on-one -on -one matchup, it's just the basic fundamentals you were taught. He keeps coming back to that. See? For the defensive backs, you just be disciplined and Keep your eyes disciplined. Keep your eyes disciplined. I, I, I had to ponder that one. What are you looking at? What are you looking for? What are you distracted by? What are you focusing on? I think that for us as Christians, it's so easy to be distracted. We get, there's so much going on, you know, and... Uh, and we go, oh, okay, here, you know, and there. And, you know, we have the spiritual ADHD, you know, which, which I have spiritually, physically, emotionally, and relationally. But uh, it uh, goes undiagnosed in many of you all. And, <laughs> and, and that is, uh, you know, we need, a, we need sort of a holy Ritalin uh, for, for our spirits, right? For our, to, to help us have disciplined eyes. Now, um, Eileen and I, uh, we went to Disneyland this week on Monday. Great day to go, you know? End of January, Monday, <laughs> nothing happening. It was brutally cold, got down to 68. Nobody wanted, <laughs> nobody wanted to go out, you know? And uh, we took Damien and Annie, used the wheelchair trick, you know, to get skip the lines. Uh, when we first walked in, it was the most exciting place, and we were talking about it. Eileen and I were talking. You, you just want to live here forever. If you, you walk in the first, you know, it's so exciting, and there's all these things happening, and uh, visual and music, and all these things, and you just think, wow, if I could just have this be my life. About 4.30. <laughs> about 4.30. I got to get out of here. <laughs> this is driving me nuts. How, these people are still happy. They're still singing. They're still, you know, 
we, we went and hid in the Blue Bayou restaurant by Pirates of the Caribbean because it's dark and there's water and you can't see anything and you can't hear anybody else and you sit there for a couple of hours all alone in the dark chamber under... Now we have to go back out there, you know. Well, I gotta admit, I don't have disciplined eyes a lot of times, and I, and I need to learn from this. I need to say, well, how do I stay focused on what God wants to have happen in me? How do I stay focused on the, on the, the life that he wants me to experience? How do I stay focused on, on experiencing the joy? Not just telling you all about it, but actually experiencing the joy in my own life. How do I stay focused on the command to love each other like he's loved us? Well, um, do you want me to answer that question? Because actually, I actually have a practical answer for how I stay focused doing that. Should I tell you that? Okay. Just if you insist. <laughs> if you insist. Well, Wednesday morning at 7 o'clock, uh, somebody comes and opens up the church, and... Uh, a small group of us show up and we go in and we sit down and somebody's brought a donut or or we pull out the old leftover bagels sometimes you know <laughs> to try and heat them up and uh, and we sit there we open up the Bible and we pass it around and we read portions of it and then we begin to check in and we start to share our life and we listen to each other and sometimes it's hard things to listen to and sometimes it's good things and um, but each person gets asked questions about what's going on and how's God uh, meeting you in these situations and uh, we do that for about an hour or so and then everybody gets up and goes off to work and uh, we go on with our lives and I realized that's how God's letting me have disciplined eyes to see what's important to hear from people, to, to have a, a small group of uh, people that we gather around each week and um, we don't know what's going to be shared next. There's no lesson plan. Uh, and yet, real life comes out. And I, and I think that um, I once got in trouble uh, years ago for, for in a sermon once. I said, if you're not in a small group, you're out of God's will. <laughs> I got in terrible trouble for that. They, uh, people were saying, you know, you're saying that I'm going to hell if I'm not in a small group with you. <laughs> I would, no, I don't want you in a small group with me. <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. forget that. <laughs> uh, and yeah, you may be going to hell. I, I don't know about that, you know, but uh, I think that God wants us to love one another. And how do we do it if we're never with each other? And we're never with each other consistently and over time and hearing enough and caring enough to ask. And so um, I think that our, uh, the secret of loving each other like, like Christ loved us is we have to have a commitment to each other and to Christ that, uh, that stops us from being detached observers of life and ministry and relationships. It's so easy to have undisciplined eyes and become detached. And um, we have to choose to be as committed to people and to Christ as Christ is committed to us. Right? And that means we have to choose to meet. So, so I'm going to stick with it. Yeah, if you're not in a small group, you're out of God's will. I'm, I'm staying with it. Don't write me. That's okay. The other thing that comes with this is in order for us to be friends, remember, I call you friends, not just servants, not just hard workers, I call you friends. The key to being friends is that we have an honesty that, that, that starts to reflect vulnerability. And, um, and we don't just share about what happened in the past, although that's really nice, but remember, Cam Chancellor said, we, do, we, we look at what the mistakes we've made and then we talk about it and then we leave it in the past. And we go forward. And I think that's one of the things that happens. We can look at our past and we can say, yeah, whew, screwed up there. Okay, wow, that was embarrassing. 
Uh, and we don't share it so that people can give us advice, because I don't want advice from y'all, but we share it so that God can work on us because now we're open to hearing God address something in our life, right? That's why we bring it out. And, uh, and the vulnerability starts to happen. Now, it's got to be relevant. It has to be a real life. You know, I've been in, anybody ever get in a Bible study where they like, you know, pull out commentaries and study the frou-frou words and stuff, you know? And uh, usually that's not very relevant. It's interesting, it's fascinating, you know. I always love every once in a while in a sermon to say, in the Greek, this, you know. <laughs> that says, I went to college, you know. And, uh, and so, um, but that's not relevant. What's relevant is, what does God want to do in us today? What does he want to do in me today? What does he want to, where is he taking us? And that's, that's not only relevant, that's actually fascinating. And, and, and we can love each other enough and be enough friends that we begin to leave the past behind and, and go forward and encourage each other to go forward. Um, you know, one of the things that... Um, I spend way too much time in church, okay? I confess that. It's my sin. <laughs> But um, over the years, I spent a lot of time in church. And, there, and uh, have you noticed that in church, there's often a lot of talk about uh, what we've done wrong, but there's not, a, or where we've been, but there's not a lot of talk about our dreams and our hopes. We don't, people don't ask us about our dreams and hopes. They always ask, where you been? Well, I'm struggling with this. I'm dealing with that. I, you know, I'm trying to get over the other. And, but they don't say, what, what's the hope that God gave you? What hope do you have as you go forward? Well, I hope I can get over that, and I hope I can get beyond. <laughs> no, I, I would really begin to look forward. Um, I'm thinking that that's what uh, Christ does when he loves us. He calls us to live beyond our forgiveness. One thing, we're forgiven. I, I'm glad for that. I'm grateful, right? I'm willing to accept that. I claim it. But you've got to live beyond the forgiveness. So, so Christ forgives our sins. We're, we're uh, released from that. And then what? If we just go blank at that point? We, we don't have focused eyes. We don't have discipline to say, Wait, I'm forgiven for a reason, right? I'm forgiven so that I can live forward. Um, one of the one of the things that I've noticed, that I've, I've been watching, you know, the coach of the Seahawks. Okay, uh, he was a failed coach, by the way. You know, he had one year in New Jersey and just lost everything. It was an embarrassment, and his and he was considered a total failure in the pros. He can have a nice career in college, you know. Um, now everybody's going, wow. But, but have you noticed when he talks? Have you ever heard an interview with him? His, his, the thing I heard him say the other day was, um, we're not uh, overly excited about this game Sunday. It's really important, as have been each of the games that we've played. He said, we, have, we go into each game hoping that we're going to come out 1-0 and at the end. All that matters is that game, and we come out 1-0. and So why wouldn't we have that same feeling as we come into this one? We're going to come out 1-0 and in this game come Sunday evening. Right? And I thought, he's not dwelling on what happened in New Jersey years ago in his failure. He's not dwelling on uh, past victories or celebrating them or wasn't that great. He's just saying, we have, a, we have a mission. We're on our mission. We're focused on our mission. And we're going to do the fundamentals as we've done, right? And for, for us as followers of Christ, and we're on a mission, right? What is the, the fundamental we're to do? Love each other. 
love each other, which means we have to stop being observers and we have to become involved with each other. We have to ask questions and we have to uh, share vulnerably and we have to take seriously that we have a command to fulfill. Now I was going to tell you, you know, I, I prayed about this and I was going to tell you who's going to win today. Um, should I? No, better not. You know. Even though I probably know, maybe the Lord gave me that insight. It doesn't matter, really. It doesn't matter who wins. And there's a lot in our life that doesn't matter. A lot of things that we've clung to that don't matter. There's a lot of issues that we carry around with us, and they don't matter. But when Jesus said, I want you to know what matters, he said, I want my joy to be in you and your joy to be complete. That matters. And I'm commanding this. You've got to love each other. Like I love you. And you're going to be fruitful. Now, each time we do communion here, and we share in the Lord's Supper, um, I always say the same thing uh, at the end of it. I quote Jesus' words here in this verse. I'm the vine, and you are the branches. Cut off from me, you can do nothing. And then I say, but with Christ, all things are possible. Now, I've said that every single time we've had communion here that I've led you. And... Um, and I really believe that. And I think that, that as we focus on that, we'll have disciplined eyes. We won't have spiritual ADD. We won't get distracted. We won't lose sight of what he has for us because we'll be connected. And so in the, in the spirit of being connected, we're going to do that today.